Well, Frankfurt is my home. I grew up here, went to school at Frankfurt High, and uh, was in the, after I got out of college, uh, high school, I uh, worked for, I think, three years for a shoe company here in Frankfurt. The old, uh, I've forgotten the name of the company, but uh, then came World War II, and I was of that age group that was eligible for draft, and I volunteered and went into the old Army Air Corps, it was at that time, and spent four, a little over four years in service. I spent my time overseas on the island of Guam in the South Pacific, and I was on a, I was a crew member, a radar bombardier on a B-29. And after I got out of college, uh, the service, I went back to college and I had gone to college at UK 1938 and 39 year. And when I came back, why, of course, it was in the 40s, 60s, and I went back to college at UK and got my degree in engineering in 1949. I had worked here during the spring breaks and the summer vacations from the university. I worked here uh, part uh, for a few few weeks and uh, got to know the plant and they got to know me. So when I graduated, I was offered a job here and I went to work here in 1949. Really, I was a maintenance engineer for the plant for two or three years and then I was made a, the plant engineer which covered all of the construction work and modernization and updating equipment and this sort of thing. I had hoped and worked toward becoming a plant manager or, and I was promoted to a plant superintendent from engineering in 19... I've forgotten a year, but I was promoted after about 15 years in engineering. I was promoted to plant superintendent, they called it at that time. And from that point, I was then put in some management training programs, and I was the plant manager and the master distiller uh, from, from that time till I till the plant was sold in 1982. So I went from 68 to 82 as a plant manager. And master distiller, they called it. The person I worked for for a, a number of years, uh, who was the plant manager, a fellow by the name of Orville Shupp, he had a lot, he was a, engineer in the background also a graduate of Purdue and uh, he had a lot of influence on my career here. He and the distiller at that time, a fellow by the name of Al Geyser, uh, he was a distiller for many years here and uh, I worked closely with him as a plant engineer and then as a plant superintendent. So particularly those two guys, and, and I'm sure there was many others, and I got to know uh, Ronnie Eddings and, and the, uh, uh, Leonard Riddle and those guys. And what were, the, what were the differences in responsibility between the plant superintendent, which you had been, and the plant manager, which you became? Hardly any difference, really. 
when I left the plant superintendent's job, it was not replaced. So I just simply moved my desk to a different location and uh, had the same responsibilities, really, that I had uh, as a superintendent. Only I wasn't answering. As a superintendent, I answered to the plant manager. And then when I became plant manager, I, I answered to our central office in Cincinnati. What do you remember about uh, Albert B. Blanton? Well, the thing I remember, and I do recall a rather humorous incident on his, about him. He was the resident manager and a big stockholder of Shenley when I came to work here. And Albert was a quiet guy, uh, knew what he was doing, had the respect, I think, of all the people at the plant. But when I was brought in for uh, an interview, when uh, Orville Schiff brought me in to interview for a job here when I graduated, and he took me in to see Colonel Blanton, and the colonel was in the, the corner office down there, a corner uh, uh, room of that office. And when we walked in, he had the, these armbands, like you see gamblers wearing, on each arm, and a green eye shade on, and he looked up at me, and uh, Orville said, <coughs> Colonel, this is a young man I've been telling you about. I'm, I want him to come to work down here. I wanted you to meet him. And the Colonel looked up out of his uh, eye shade. He said, son, we're not hiring any hands today. And I thought that was the end of the commerce, end of the interview. We got outside. Orville said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. You come to work Monday morning. <laughs> and I did. And every time I'd pass the colonel in on the lot, he'd look at me kind of cross. I, I could see what he was thinking. How in the hell did you get in here? <laughs> but uh, he was a nice guy. And everybody uh, thought highly of Albert. He built a, <coughs> I guess you all have been told, uh, the stone house on the hill was uh, where the colonel lived with his wife. And uh, that's where he lived till he died. Did you have much interaction with him uh, during those early years? Not too much, not too much, uh-uh. He retired, uh, I was was only, uh, he retired the third year I was working at the plant. So as a plant maintenance engineer, I didn't have too much contact with the colonel. But uh, I knew he was here and I knew who he was. and He was nice to everybody. And they did a lot of bottling, a lot of shipping. There's Harlan. What was that sound that's, that we just heard? That's a whistle telling everybody it's 12 o'clock. It's a, it's a horn in the boiler room. It's operated by steam pressure. And uh, they blow it at 12 o'clock. And I think it... I'm not sure. I believe they blow it again at 4 o'clock. Anyway, I know they blow it at noon. Is that a long-standing tradition? Have they been yeah. doing that for many years? It's been there all, all my life, all my time anyway. They've uh, had a steam whistle that they blew at noon. Do you start to feel hungry as soon as you hear that <laughs> whistle blowing? You know, you know it's time to, to go to lunch, yeah. We also have interviewed for this project Jimmy Johnson, as, as you know. Uh, 
What do you remember of Jimmy back in the early days? I remember him as a being a, he was a, we called them crew leaders. He was a foreman of a, a gang of men who had the job of putting new whiskey barrels in their ricks in the warehouse and also for taking out aged whiskey for bottling. And I knew Jimmy as being a, a person who was very likable, but he could get a day's work out of, out of his people and he treated them with respect and they, they all liked Jimmy. His uh, dad, I, I'm sure you already know this, his dad worked here also. Were there a fair number of African Americans working at the distillery in those early days? Or was Jimmy Not too of... many. There was, when I came to work here, I guess there was maybe 15 out of the whole 250 or so people. Uh, and their jobs was generally in the janitorial type work or what we call the yard work, doing the maintenance of the trees and the grounds, mowing grass, that sort of thing. They were, uh, they were treated with, they were treated well, but they was treated separately, sort of. There was separate restrooms, Downstairs in the cafeteria, they had a special room for the blacks to eat in. And that was went on until about, oh, when the Equal Opportunity Act came into being, and I've forgotten a year there, but it was uh, at that time while we integrated all of the and the blacks began to enter in all of the jobs that they was uh, bid on in the union way of doing things. Who owned the distillery at that time? Who? Shenley. Shenley. Shenley owned it for them. They became ownership in 1929. They bought the plant and they sold it in 1982. They sold it to some people who had been in the bourbon business, a couple of gentlemen, one of them from New York and one of them from Owensboro. Uh, they bought the plant. They got the financing necessary to buy the plant and they bought it and they operated it for 10 years. What was your feeling about Shenley management? Do you feel, feel they wisely managed the plant? Did you get along well with the, the management? Yes. Uh, as, a, as I answered to the, as the plant manager, I answered to a, a office in Cincinnati. They had a, that was their production headquarters. Well, not their sales headquarters, but production headquarters. And, uh, I got along well with those people in Cincinnati. As long as you kept the bottom line right, why you got treated well. How did the position of master distiller uh, come into existence? You already were in charge of the entire plant. Yeah. And so adding another title to your name must have had a purpose. How did that happen? Uh, it happened when the plant was sold to the people I mentioned. Uh, in addition to the plant management job, they uh, also named me as the master distiller. Now, of course, there was a distiller doing the job. I was just uh, figurehead to to uh, be responsible for what he was doing. 
So at that time, the addition of the term master distiller uh, didn't change your job responsibilities? Not really. at all. It sure didn't. What do you think was the thinking behind creating a, a new title uh, for someone who would continue to do the, the same, same work. work? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, the uh, Apparently the people who owned the plant uh, felt this was a, a title that was they could use in marketing and advertising promotion. That's interesting because certainly in modern times, as you very well know, master distillers uh, become the public face in some sense yeah. of, of the distillery. Um, so you, you think perhaps the that's, beginning of that concept was... That was, was right. That's correct. That's when they uh, started calling on me for promotional type work, being a figurehead representing the plant locally and and in the marketplace, uh, doing quite a bit of traveling to uh, promote the brands. And uh, that was, I think, what was behind it. Was that concept of having a publicly visible master distiller a new concept at that point in the bourbon business? It was to me. I don't know. Um, there was uh, some of our competitors used the same terminology of master distiller for their distiller and uh, still do. Jimmy Russell over at Wild Turkey and Booker No down at Bardstown and, and those people. What was the organization to whom the distillery was sold in 1982? You said several people, but who were these people? Uh, one of them was a, he was involved in sales uh, with Shinley at one time. He was quite well known in the marketplace, I know. And the other guy, Bob Baranaskis, he was a financial type guy. He knew how to, as I was told when I found out the plant was sold, I asked my boss, in Cincinnati, I said, what about these guys? What, what, what are they like? He said, well, Ferdy Falk, who was uh, one of the guys, said he knows how to sell whiskey. And said, Bob Baranescus knows how to make a buck. So they pegged them real right, because I don't want to speak against them too much, but they they took a lot out of this plant. They sold the assets off and uh, didn't spend the money necessary to maintain the plant like it should have been maintained. And they sold it, of course, to uh, Zazerac in 1980, 80, 1992. So is it a fair assessment that the distillery was going downhill, let's say, in the early oh, 80s? Oh, it, it really was down, going downhill fast. Uh, it got pretty run down when uh, Zazerac, or the present company, bought it. Uh, they seen fit to put quite a bit of money into bringing it back up to its former self and uh, modernizing and updating equipment. They've spent a whole lot of money on making it a good, uh, good distillery out of it. The decline of the distillery in the 80s, uh, was that, do you think, more the result of perhaps management decisions at that time by the current owners, or rather the owners at that time, or did it partially reflect a downturn in the bourbon business? It reflected the uh, downturn in the bourbon business. It really went went way down in the 80s. 
a result of several factors. Uh, health factor being one. Uh, mad, drunk driving, mad, uh, impact on the business. And uh, the public seemed to be turning toward other products other than whiskey. The, uh, I think a Scotch whiskey was quite popular then. The Canadian whiskey was quite popular. And uh, bourbon kind of went down, down the long even went way down. And the idea of the single barrel bourbon, which I was manager at the time, uh, and the concept of selecting the best aged whiskey and bottling it one barrel at a time started with the uh, first brand we put out was Blanton's, named Blanton. And uh, it didn't take off very well. The first year or two was just, they spent more money on advertising than they did on uh, return. But as the word got out, and people started trying it. Uh, it took a turn up, it's still going up. The single barrel bourbons, the premium bourbons, has, uh, I won't say dominated the market, but they've got a big place in the marketplace now. Tell me a little bit about the development of the Blanton's brand. It was the first single barrel bourbon, as you said, someone had to have that idea. Who had that idea and how did it Well, uh, the manager, it's, uh, not the manager, the Bob Marinescus, uh, one of the owners of the plant, came to me and I was the manager. said, Elmer, we want to come out with a premium bourbon. Give us your thoughts and ideas as to how we can develop uh, a uh, premium priced bourbon. Well, we kicked around a lot of ideas, but the one idea that caught on to his fancy, when I told him about Albert Blanton's uh, lifestyle, and, he had parties quite often, and when he did, he'd ask the warehouseman to bring him some samples out of his favorite warehouse, and he'd tell him he'd tell him what age he wanted, and it was eight years or better, and bring him those samples, and he'd sample them and taste test them, and he'd pick out one or two barrels, and he'd say, bottle those for me. And he'd use those for his entertainment purposes. Well, that sounded like a pretty good thought and idea to Bob Baranaskis. And he says, we're going to go with that, and we want you to select the bourbons that goes into this Blanton. We're going to name it Blanton. And they designed, a, or didn't design, they selected a very distinctive bottle for it and uh, capped it off with a stopper that had a racehorse on it and uh, put it out in the market. The first market was 19, fall of 1984. And uh, I can say it didn't do much the first year, but as the word got out, why uh, the uh, Bob invited our competitors to do the same sort of thing, and none of them responded to him. For we 
after the Blanton was introduced, we came out with the Rock Hill Farms, Hancock Reserve, and uh, then when I retired in 1986, they asked me if I could, if they could name a bourbon after me. I told them yes, provided you let me pick the bourbon, and they said no problem. So they still, I still select the barrels for that. But at any rate, the uh, single barrel bourbons and the so-called small batch bourbons are are the bourbons that are growing uh, more than any other element of the business. A point is made with the Blanton's label in particular that it comes from Warehouse H. That's correct. That was the Colonel's favorite house. He thought, with his taste, he thought it aged the best bourbon at the plant. And uh, we still continue that practice. Uh, all the Blantons come out of Warehouse H. It's an old metal clad building that uh, changes temperatures with, with the, whenever the temperature outside changes, it changes inside just as well. And uh, he liked that house. Now that isn't the, it isn't my favorite warehouse. My favorite warehouse is warehouse I and K because it seems to age the bourbon for my brand the best. And that's where I get all the samples for, for that brand. Why do the different warehouses age the bourbon in a different way? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, they do, I don't know, that I know. I suppose part of it is due to the uh, orientation of the house with the compass, whether it's north or south or east or west. And the prevailing winds or prevailing atmosphere uh, is different in different houses due to the way they are oriented. So, would it be fair to say that that the warehouse in which the bourbon is aged, and perhaps the level uh, above the ground that the barrels sit, is the most important factor in determining the the flavor profile of the of the final product? Uh, each one of our premium bourbons, all our single barrel bourbons, and our Buffalo Trace bourbon, which is a small batch bourbon. They're always in the upper floor levels of the warehouse, and they uh, they're usually aged eight years or so, and so the premium bourbons all are aged, as we call it, that the, they're selected at the peak of their taste test, and. Uh, they come out of the various warehouses at the upper level. And uh, each, each brand, each one of these brands has got a, uh, a standard established. And those were done with, by taste testing of our, our people that's on the taste panel they were established, and once they're established and accepted as being what they want, then when we taste test individual barrels, we taste it against, we taste the, the standard first, and you remember that, and then each sample you taste after that, it, it either matches or it doesn't match that standard. Uh, if, they're, if the selection has been the way in the upper floors and uh, eight years or so, they'll mostly match. But uh, there's a panel of about nine, 
about nine or 12 people on the panel and at least four or five of us taste each round of samples. And uh, if they're approved, they're marked approved and they're bottled one barrel at a time. What is special about the upper levels of the warehouse? Or what is different about the upper levels of the warehouse compared to the lower levels? They seem to change. You, the thing, one of the things that brings about good aging is change of temperature. And you have a more change of temperatures in the mid section and upper section than you do down on the lower section. Uh, the lower sections uh, will maintain their temperatures. Uh, they don't fluctuate like the uh, upper levels do. And so what use would you put to bourbon that, for example, has been stored in the very lowest level of the level warehouse? Uh, the, some of those uh, bourbons on the lower levels are designated for some of the brands with higher age. We've got brands that's bottled at 12 years old, 15 years old, up to 20 years old. And those, you, want, you don't want them to age too quickly. They go over the hill if they do. So uh, they put on, the barrels that are put on the first floor generally are wind up in one of those type brands. So if you wish to age your bourbon for a long time, you keep it on the lower level. And if you wish to age the bourbon in a shorter time, you put it on the upper level. What, in your opinion at least, is the ideal age for bourbon? Eight to 10 years old. Now, Blanton's, generally is nine years old or thereabouts. Uh, Elmer T. Lee is nine to 10 years old. Uh, Rock Hill Farms, they're all at nine, eight to 10 years old. And uh, Buffalo Trace started out, still is nine, about nine to nine and a half years old. So you get your smoothest tasting bourbon at, in my opinion, in the eight to 10 year class. Now once it gets over that old, and we do have some brands that are 15 years old, uh, we, in a joint venture with the uh, Van Winkles, they got one 23 years old. And uh, it's pricey. But to me, to my taste, I don't prefer that because it, it gets too woody tasting and it, you get a tannic acid type taste. You get an acid taste. But a lot of people like that. They want it to taste that way. So there's a market for it. Tell me a little bit more about the Elmer T. Lee brand. Uh, as you said earlier, that was established some years ago uh, upon your retirement. Is that not true? In 1986. 1986. Uh -huh. uh, tell me a bit about your the process of selection. You do that. Um, tell me what you look what you're looking for. I'm looking for what I consider to be the proper taste for bourbon. It's going to have the characteristics that good bourbon has. It's going to have vanilla type taste. It's going to have a smooth taste to the to the palate. It's going to have some uh, vanilla. I mentioned that vanilla taste to it, and uh, it's just a good smooth bourbon flavor to it. It's highly flavored, not highly flavored. But it's got a good flavor to it and it don't have a aftertaste burn to it that's the things I 
I guard against when I'm tasting it. How many barrels do you taste, for example? How long does that process take? It takes, uh, if as you probably would think, if you taste about eight or ten samples, your taste buds begin to become numb. So you got to take a break. So if there's 25 samples to be evaluated, I'll do about eight or ten of them, and then I'll take a break for a while, and I'll come back and do the rest of them, or come back maybe two two different times. And uh, we do have water available. We rinse our mouth out after each taste test, and uh, after it's tasted, your taste buds primarily are, are the most sensitive ones are on the side of your mouth, and you kind of wallow the sample around in your mouth, and then you spit it out after you've tasted it. You certainly couldn't, couldn't drink all of those samples and get out very well. What fraction of the barrels that you taste do you eventually finally choose for the Elmer T. Lee brand? Uh, the last, within the last year, it's been, been high, 90% or so. Out of the 25 bottles that I did on Monday, uh, I think it was only three rejects that I, I took. And not only I, but the people on the panel, they will not, do not bottle any batch or barrel until at least three, three people or more have taste tested it. And any one person can reject anyone on the panel. So generally I notice uh, after we uh, taste test, we sign off on it. I notice, uh, oh, in the last few months, there's been at least five or six people tasting uh, every batch that comes up for taste test. What is the basis for choosing the barrels that you will taste? Certain warehouses, certain positions in the warehouses? What do you use to make that choice initially? <coughs> well, each each warehouse has got a profile that's supposedly followed. When we make the whiskey, we put away so much in this warehouse, so much in that warehouse, and <coughs> the uh, selection then becomes from those locations for whatever brand you have that you're looking for. For instance, on the Buffalo Trace, all of those barrels comes out of Warehouse C, B, C, yeah, Warehouse C. And they're generally out of the third floor up. What are your thoughts about barrel strength bourbons? Barrel strength? Bourbon? That is to say, bourbons that yeah. are sold as some of the antique collection uh, at, bottles are it's sold at barrel strength. Yeah, that's, there's a marketplace for them, but uh, uh, how anyone can drink those straight is beyond me. Uh, they need a lot of dilution with distilled water or water or whatever you use for a, a mix of your drink with. But uh, we have, a, uh, I believe, uh, George C. Stagg is barrel strength. Uh, Booker No down at Bardstown, his, his bourbon, Booker's, is barrel strength. 137 proof, and you know, got it. Pretty potent. If you 
buy a barrel strength bourbon and then add water to reduce the proof to normal drinking proof, you still have something that is different uh, from, uh, for example, Elmer T. Lee because uh, the barrel strength product has not been chill filtered. That's what right. do you think, uh, if any, is the effect of chill filtration? Chill filtration is the preferred filtration system at this plant. It does take some of the color and a little bit of the taste from the product. So you want to minimize that in your filtration process and uh, chill filtration is what we do. Now, there was a time when Bob and Ferdy were running the plant, they went to charcoal filtration, which I didn't, I argued against. But uh, I don't know, I couldn't tell you what uh, other plants use. I think wild turkey uses chill filtration. Uh, down at uh, Beam, I don't know what, what whether they use chill filtration or, or uh, charcoal, but that's the two main filtration systems. Tell me something about the brands that were produced here at the distillery prior to the early 80s, prior to this explosion of uh, boutique brands. Uh, Ancient Age is one of the flagstep, flagship brands that Chinley had for this plant. Uh, Echo Springs, Crema, Kentucky. Uh, there were several brands that I can't recall, right? minor brands, but they had, oh, Eight or, eight or nine brands that they were doing here. Ancient Age was the big, big volume item. About a million and a half cases a year. Ancient Age was big in Florida, uh, North, South, North, South Carolina, Texas, uh, Arkansas. California, and uh, some of the uh, the Echo Springs was mostly Ohio, I think. But at any rate, they, like you mentioned, there was different brands that seemed to be targeted for certain areas, certain states. Let me read a quotation from you from a book recently published. Uh, the quotation is as follows. Some of the bourbons I've tasted that were made before Prohibition were very similar to some of our good high-end bourbons now. What did you mean by that? <laughs> I meant that for my taste, the bourbons, that the high-end bourbons now uh, paralleled the taste of those made prior to Prohibition. Uh, the prior to Prohibition, actually we haven't changed too many things about our distilling process from that time to this time. A uh, little change in formula, a little change in distillation proof, and different aging procedures, but Pretty much the same, same way it was made then is being made now. I had an opportunity to taste a pre-prohibition bottle, um, and it had a pretty good taste to it. I thought it was uh, Jim Murray, who's a spirits writer. Uh, picked that bottle up in Italy and um, had it with him and we was out here in the clubhouse and Mark Brown and myself and uh, Jim Murray uh, opened that bottle and each one of us taste tested it and all of us thought it was pretty good stuff. 
So that kind of suggests that the standard bourbon of pre-prohibition times was similar in quality to the very best bourbon today. Well, the best bourbons that was made pre-prohibition uh, might be true of. Uh, I'm sure there was bourbons made then that wasn't up to what we think would be standard now. Perhaps the bourbon, the pre-prohibition bourbon that you tasted was in fact among the, the best uh, available at that time. It that could be. What's one difference or one big change you have noticed over your years in the field? Well, being a production man myself, uh, the major change that's taken place in the production end of the business, the formula, the recipe has been changed some, but not significantly. The biggest change has been in updating the equipment and putting it under computer control rather than manual control. Prior to the updating and computer controlled, it was all dependent on an individual, how well he did his job each day and following, following the, the uh, process the way it's supposed to be. And uh, Harlan has been able to modernize and put uh, computer controls on most of the operation now, at making operation. Uh, the hasn't been too much change in the warehousing procedures. Uh, There hadn't been a lot of changes in the bottling procedures either, except to uh, update equipment and make it higher speed and more productive. What about changes in public perception of bourbon over the time that you have been in the industry? I think the perception has swung to our favor, the bourbon flavor, favor in the last certainly within the last 10 years. Prior to that, uh, uh, bourbon wasn't one of the favored drinks in the marketplace, but uh, I think it's changed now to where a lot of people are drinking bourbon rather than scotch or Canadian or, or tequila or rum or some other alcoholic drink. When you were uh, first getting into the bourbon industry, uh, what was the public perception of bourbon at that time? W was it something you just drank uh, very frequently or was it something you didn't drink very often and was thought to be evil? Or What was the, the thought? I think the perception in the public was generally favorable. Um, people uh, probably didn't drink as much then as they are now. Uh, but it was a pretty favorable position when I came to work here. Uh, bourbon was still riding a pretty good wave. And it didn't start going down till the, till the 80s. How would you like to see the bourbon industry change in the future? Is there some direction in which you think it might go that would be useful, productive? No, I would say keep doing what you're doing, but try to do it better. Uh, I don't believe the, the bourbon recipe is going to change very much. It did change gradually. The, back in the 40s and early 50s, uh, they changed the recipe and the process to make it a little more palatable, smoother, 
in opera than in, in the past. But uh, been very little changes in the in the process. When you sit down to drink some bourbon, I suppose it's almost certain that you would choose Elmer T. Lee. I do. How do you how do you drink it? How do I drink it? I different people have different tastes, of course, but I like a little uh, soda with lime lemon flavor, uh, Seven Up, Sprite, something like that. But uh, I take and put out a, a shot, one ounce, over ice cubes, and a little bit of Seven Up or Sprite. That's the way I like it. A lot of people are drinking it with Coca Cola, which. Uh, don't appeal to me, but it's a lot of people drink it that way. A lot of people drink it straight up or, you know, without anything but water. And some of them drink it straight uh, by just, just a shot down. There has already been a book written on the history of this distillery and no doubt sometime in the future, let's say 10, 20 or more years in the future, another history of this distillery will probably be written. What would you like uh, such a book to say about you? What would they say about me? I'd hope that they'd uh, see me in the light of being a good manager, a person who treated his people, the employees, fairly and squarely, and uh, not a hard person to get along with.